Good morning. I'm Joanne Myers, Director of Public Affairs Program, and on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. It is a pleasure to welcome Bob Kuttner, a leading political economist, to our breakfast program. Mr. Kuttner is a person who persuasively writes about what he believes in, and in so doing, conveys a message of urgency for all of us to reclaim our democratic politics and our prosperity. For decades, he has successfully pursued this theme as a writer, editor, teacher, lecturer, commentator, and public official. You can learn more about him by reading his CV, which was handed out when you checked in. Today, he will be discussing two books, The Squandering of America, How the Failure of Our Politics Undermines Our Prosperity, and Obama's Challenge, America's Economic Crisis and the Power of a Transformative Presidency. No one doubts the magnitude of what Barack Obama achieved in becoming America's 44th president, but moving forward, everything will depend on how he governs. This election was about many things. It was about big issues, a global economic meltdown, a massive government intervention in the financial markets, and of course, two wars which must be resolved. Although it began with the war in Iraq as its central focus, by election day, it was mostly about the economy. As President-elect Obama approaches the presidency, the national coffers are virtually empty, much of our infrastructure is crumbling, the education we offer our children is falling behind, and the healthcare system needs to be rebuilt. The tasks facing the new president are daunting. In The Squandering of America, our speaker explores the political roots of America's narrowing prosperity and the systematic financial risks facing the U.S. economy. By sharing his ideas for a more balanced and managed form of capitalism, he offers clear alternatives to failed and undemocratic policies on everything from trade to entitlement. He argues for broader distribution of opportunities and more economic security for all. In advocating a populist resurgence in which brave politicians re-energize and reconnect with the public, one might have thought that Mr. Cutler was imagining a president who would transform politics as we have known it. Just as he was prescient in warning of the impending financial collapse, in a leap of faith, before the election, he seized the moment and published the perfect companion piece to Squandering of America entitled Obama's Challenge, America's Economic Crisis and the Power of a Transformative Presidency. In it, he explains what President-elect Obama will need to do to redeem his own promise and the promise of America. It is not only a call for economic change, but a challenge for our next president as he takes over a nation weary of the past and weary of the future. Mr. Kuttner leaves us with the audacity to hope that President-elect Obama can seize the moment and become the transformative leader that will help all Americans to recover a sense of optimism and to believe in limitless possibilities once again. While there is no magic wand that President-elect Obama can wave, he could take the advice of our speaker and become the transformative president we are all hoping for and at this time desperately need. Now, can you all join me in welcoming our speaker? Yes, you can. Bob Cutler. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, there is a... Uh, a passage in, in uh, Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises where uh, one character says to the other, uh, how did you go bankrupt? And the other one says, two ways, gradually and then suddenly. <laughs> and uh, if, you, if you think about that, the reason you go bankrupt gradually and then suddenly is the suddenly part happens when people stop lending you money. Uh, when people take a good look at your balance sheet and realize that you are already de facto bankrupt and then you can't keep up the, the pretense uh, any longer. Um, I started writing uh, the book that became The Squandering of America in 2004-2005 uh, and I was interested in the connection between two things. Uh, the widening inequality and insecurity that uh, face face most uh, Americans, and the uh, deregulation of uh, our financial system, and uh, the prevalent, uh, ubiquitous at the time, philosophy of, uh, of market fundamentalism. The idea that markets could do nothing wrong and that governments could do nothing right. And um, 
I had explored this in an earlier book uh, called Everything for Sale, uh, The Virtues and Limits of Markets, where uh, I looked hard at what realms of the economy work as markets as we study them in economics courses, where supply and demand determines price and uh, allocate resources efficiently, and what realms of the economy don't work as markets. And I, I concluded that you know, 60, 70 percent of the, uh, of, of the economy works perfectly well as a market. But if you look at education and health and research and development, public infrastructure, uh, financial markets themselves, um, you can't trust markets to allocate resources efficiently. You can't trust markets to regulate themselves. They uh, overinvest in things that pollute. They underinvest in things that lead to growth. Uh, like education and research and development, they underinvest in things that we need as a society, like public health. And in the case of uh, financial institutions, uh, you need the stabilizing and supervising uh, role of government so that uh, financial markets don't turn into casinos. Now, we learned this in the 30 years uh, following 1932, and we gradually forgot it in the 30 years that began uh, in the late 70s. And uh, I argued in The Squandering of America that this was not only creating a very unequal and uh, insecure and unattractive society, but it was also laying the seeds of a, of a second Great Depression. It was laying the seeds of a second financial catastrophe. And um, there was also a political feedback loop that was undergirding this. Namely, uh, the less faith we had in public institutions, the less government delivered for ordinary people, the more cynical ordinary voters became about government. And if you have one candidate offering a rather uh, faint echo of the New Deal, but not delivering much, and the other candidate saying, well, at least I'll cut your taxes, uh, the fellow who cuts your taxes gets the vote because it's been a long time since government has delivered ordinary Americans the kind of things that were delivered to my father's generation where he became the first person in his family to become a homeowner thanks to a, a, a GI loan and uh, went to college on the GI Bill and you, you all know the story of, of, of that generation. For folks who uh, grew up uh, my age and older, uh, the idea that government could improve people's lives was actually plausible be because it did. It, make, it made a huge difference in the lives of ordinary people. But if you were 35 years old now uh, and you start out life with college debt and you have uh, trouble getting a job with health insurance and the price of home ownership is beyond your reach, unless you have an affluent family to give you a head start, you don't see government doing a damn thing for you except collecting your taxes. So in order for the uh, economic policies to change, uh, the politics have to change. The vicious circle has to be changed into uh, a virtuous circle. And um, I remember uh, in, in, uh, in writing this book, uh, I, at one point I was going to call it the coming collapse, but that seemed too apocalyptic, uh, very worried about the timing of the book because in between the time I turned the manuscript in, uh, in, in March and April of 2007, and the time the book appeared in uh, October of 2007, it, it all started to unravel. Um, anyway, so I wrote that book, and in the fall of, uh, of 07, I started thinking to myself that if I'm right, if this is going to be a very serious collapse, uh, the president who takes office in uh, uh, January 2009 uh, is going to face a very interesting situation. And I took a good look at the Democratic field where, at that point, there were three frontrunners, Edwards, uh, Hillary Clinton, and Obama. And by conventional uh, tests, Edwards was the populist, uh, Hillary was a bit more liberal, uh, Obama was a bit more centrist, and you know, a lot of my friends uh, as, as uh, fellow liberals, which I certainly am, were, were backing either Edwards or, or Hillary. And I convinced myself that of the three of them, the one who really stood a chance of becoming a great transformative president, even though he was a shade more middle of the road on the issues, was Obama because of his character, his history, something remarkable about his capacity to, uh, to lead. And uh, 
since my day job is being a magazine editor, I, I said to myself, gee, that's a good article. Uh, I want to get uh, a presidential historian to write an article about presidents who faced great crises, turned them into great opportunities, and became transformative in the sense of changing the public's conception of what was possible, what was necessary, and rallying the public to be an active constituency for surpassing change. So I telephoned uh, Doris Goodwin, who's written a couple of times for the Prospect before, who I just admire immensely, and said, will you please do this article? And she said, no. Uh, she was busy writing uh, her book on the one president she hasn't yet written about uh, of the great president, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. And I said, well, you know, is there any way I can get you to talk about this? She said, well, why don't you come to my house with a tape recorder? We'll do a transcript you can do as an interview. The thing about Doris is she speaks prose. You know, she speaks perfectly formed sentences. You don't even need to edit her. You just need to transcribe the tape. So we spent three hours, and uh, at the end of the three hours, I said, you know, this isn't just an interview. This is a book. So you have to write a book on this. She said, no, I can't, but you have to. And... Uh, I will help you. I will suggest sources. I'll even read your chapters. And so uh, Obama's Challenge, the book that became Obama's Challenge, is dedicated to Doris. And uh, then I decided to take a couple of risks. Uh, it occurred to me that um, if I waited to see who won the election and then uh, published the book, by the time it came out, there would be 50 books, 100 books. And uh, if I was right about the impending crash, then Obama would probably be elected. So I said, what the heck? I'll blow, I'll blow a few months, uh, I'll write the book, and we'll get it out by Labor Day, and uh, we'll either have a bestseller or a bonfire. So uh, it's not a bestseller less, but, uh, yet, but it's, but it's doing rather well. And um, here's the basic argument. Uh, and the, the two books, I think, can be, can be read together. Uh, why did this happen economically? Why did this happen politically? That's all in squandering of America. And then what in the heck do we do about it? Now, um, in the well-known Chinese formulation, uh, a crisis is also an opportunity. And uh, one of the things I did in, in researching uh, Obama's challenge was to take a good hard look at what the great transformative presidents have faced and what they have achieved. And I put three of them on the Democratic side on this uh, interesting Freudian slip, two Republicans, two Democrats, Lincoln, Republican. Um, when he took office, his hope was that he would save the Union. By January 1st, uh, 1863, he had issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And um, one of the things about a transformative president is that things that seem inconceivable when he takes office become inevitable by force of circumstances, by force of leadership, by force of social movements pushing the president, in this case, the abolitionist movement. Same, same thing with Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, there were three and a half years between the crash of uh, October 1929 and the inauguration of Franklin Roosevelt in, uh, in March of uh, 1933. And uh, Hoover basically chased the depression downward. Uh, it took about two years for the air to come out of the real economy after the crash of 1929. In 1930, the unemployment rate was 8.8% by the end of the year. Not anything to be proud of, but not a depression. And yet, uh, everything that Hoover did was too little and too late. And then Roosevelt, in the campaign of 32, uh, criticized Hoover from the right, criticized Hoover for spending too much money. And there's a wonderful line from Mariner Eccles' uh, memoirs. Mariner Eccles was the populist chairman of the Federal Reserve, the only one in the history of that institution, appointed by Roosevelt, a uh, banker from Utah. And in his own memoirs, commenting on the 1932 election, Eccles wrote that if you read the transcript of the debates, there, there weren't formal debates, but there were a lot of uh, uh, joint appearances and arguments, and uh, he said it looked like there was a giant typographical error where Hoover and Roosevelt were each speaking each other's lines. Hoover was the one uh, arguing for public work spending. Roosevelt was the one criticizing Hoover as a, as a big spender. Uh, Roosevelt had been a critic of deposit insurance, had been a critic of large-scale public work spending. And it took about two weeks after he took office for him to realize that 
things were uh, a lot worse than he had imagined and the remedies needed to be a lot bolder. And just as in the case of Lincoln, there were social movements on the ground pushing Roosevelt to be still more aggressive. And same thing with Lyndon Johnson. Uh, in November of 1963, the general view was that civil rights legislation was, was hopelessly blocked. Uh, those were the years when the Dixiecrats, uh, the Southern Segregationist Committee chairs, could uh, tie up legislation. Uh, the country was divided. Public opinion polls showed that 50% of Americans felt that Kennedy was moving too fast on civil rights. Bobby Kennedy was trying to broker between the Southern governors and the sheriffs on the one hand and Dr. King on the other hand, and it was not going anywhere. But when Johnson took office, he resolved that his legacy was to be the redemption of civil rights. And when uh, the 1964 Civil Rights Act passed in July of 64, this was before the landslide election of November 64, it was the same 88th Congress, the same segregationist uh, committee chairs, but the combination of, Roosevelt, uh, of Johnson's uh, legislative mastery and the bravery of the movement on the ground and the shift in public opinion that was created both by, Rose, uh, by Johnson's leadership and by the bravery of the civil rights movement uh, transformed what was deemed possible. So I think this is the situation that uh, Obama faces. Uh, things that were deemed inconceivable six months ago will be barely adequate six months from now. And um, only a president can achieve this. The president needs help from the citizenry. Uh, one of the intriguing questions is what is going to happen to this movement of young people that came together to help elect Obama? Will this simply be uh, an Obama club or will it take on a life of its own as a social movement, uh, uh, supporting him but occasionally pushing him, uh, as the civil rights movement did with Johnson, as the industrial labor movement did with Roosevelt, as the abolitionist movement did? Uh, with Lincoln. There's a kind of dance between great presidents and social movements. And lest we forget, uh, for every president who seized a crisis and turned it into an opportunity and became transformative, there's a president who uh, came to power in the face of a crisis and failed. Uh, Hoover, Carter, uh, Bush, and uh, not guaranteed. I think Obama I think many of us feel, most of us even, that there is the raw material of greatness here, but it is all going to unfold before our eyes in the next several months. So what does he need to do? Well, uh, I argue in the book and uh, in my uh, talks, uh, my efforts to influence them as a, as a friendly uh, critic, that um, he needs to be much more radical as a president than he has been as a candidate. Not radical in the sense of crazy left wing, but radical in the sense of perceiving that the conventional wisdom will not solve the problem. And the conception of what needs to be done has to be transformed or he, like Hoover, will chase a depression downward. Uh, four things for starters. Uh, first of all, he needs to get the financial rescue done right. Uh, Secretary Paulson has not achieved this. Uh, Paulson has been incredibly timid in extracting conditions from the banks in exchange for the $700 billion that the public uh, is, is giving uh, the banks. Uh, and here's the argument you hear, and I've, I have been on some of these phone calls and some of these meetings. Uh, the argument is we need to get private capital to come back to the table. If we, the Treasury, tell the banks that they can't pay dividends or that they can't pay executive bonuses <clears throat> or that they can't use this money to underwrite mergers and acquisitions, that's going to scare off private capital. Therefore, we just have to trust the banks to do it their own way. That's not good policy. And um, the person I have been promoting to be Secretary of the Treasury is uh, Sheila Baer. Uh, Sheila Baer is the chair of the FDIC. She happens to be a Republican but she's the toughest guy in the room uh, in the sense that when the FDIC takes over a failed bank, they don't just purge the toxic assets, they purge the toxic management. And um, Sheila Bear has used 
uh, IndyMac, a $32 billion failed thrift institution that the FDIC took over. They were one of the perpetrators of the subprime mess, big time. She's used this as a laboratory to do what she has uh, pushed Paulson to do and what thus far the Bush administration has refused to do. She refinances mortgages. There are 60,000 uh, distressed mortgages held either by IndyMac or serviced by IndyMac on behalf of bondholders, and she is refinancing every one of them that needs refinancing. Uh, FDIC is one of the few government agencies involved in banking that has the technical capacity to run a bank. And I think before this is over, we're going to end up nationalizing a bank or two to show them how to do it right. If, if the banks that get this bailout uh, money are sitting on the funds and refusing to lend it, uh, Roosevelt called this yardstick competition. Instead of just throwing money at them, nationalize one and start lending. And then maybe the others will follow. That sounds pretty radical, doesn't it? But uh, it may be necessary. Or at least put some people on the board. That's what the, uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did in, in, in Roosevelt's era. They didn't just hand out money. Um, we face a similar dilemma with the auto bailout. Uh, on the one hand, it's not a secret that Detroit makes cars that not very many people want to buy. Uh, on the other hand, this is a huge linchpin industry that we can't let go down the drain. What do we do? Um, I'm not sure I have the answer, but I don't think we just hand out money with no strings attached. There's an extraordinary documentary, if you haven't seen it yet, I, I recommend it, called Who Killed the Electric Car? Uh, in the mid-90s, the California Air Quality Board passed a regulation requiring that 20 percent of all vehicles sold in California by the year 2000 be zero emission vehicles. Now, the only way you could meet that standard was to devise an electric car. General Motors did it. It was a gorgeous car. People were lined up to buy it. By 97, it was sold as a production vehicle. You could go into a showroom. They didn't sell it. They leased it. And they realized after a while they weren't making much money on it. You know, it didn't break down. Uh, they didn't have a lot of moving parts. <laughs> and uh, enviros were lined up to buy the thing. And so instead of investing in engineering or in marketing, they invested in politics and they got a new chair of uh, the California Air... I'm not making this up, and it sounds paranoid, but this is factual. Um, they got a new chairman appointed. Uh, they created an institute that he could be head of on the side as a way of bribing him. He re got the regulation repealed, and they recalled every damn one of those cars and sent them to the uh, cruncher so that there wouldn't be a single one left on the road. And now, 11 years later, they are having to reinvent what was a plug-in electric vehicle via hybrids, via converting hybrids to pure plug-in cars. I mean, that is just appalling. And uh, now these people want $25 billion or more in taxpayer aid. I don't know whether you take them out and shoot them and start over or, or what you do. It's a, it's a terrible dilemma. You have an industry that doesn't seem to learn from history and yet, how can you have no auto industry in the United States? It's one of the dilemmas that Obama is going to face. So back to my litany of four things he has to do. One, um, get the financial rescue done right so that credit starts flowing so that we're not just throwing money at bondholders. Two, put a floor under the collapse in housing prices. This is what Sheila Baer has been pushing futilely so far. And the way you do that, it seems to me, is not to bail out bondholders, bail out banks, and hope that some of it eventually trickles down to homeowners. You've got two or three billion, a million rather, depressed, uh, distressed mortgages at risk of foreclosure. If they go into foreclosure, the collapse in housing prices is going to deepen. Uh, we're eventually going to need to refinance a lot of those mortgages directly, hopefully sooner rather than later. Again, Roosevelt Homeowners Loan Corporation used the federal treasury borrowing rate to refinance mortgages at very low interest rates. Uh, HOLC in the 30s eventually refinanced one mortgage in five, uh, saved millions of people from the heartbreak of foreclosure, and, and br what's the past tense of B-R-A-K-E? Succeeded in breaking, I, I copy edit for a living, <laughs> succeeded in breaking the collapse in housing prices. Uh, that's what uh, the Obama administration uh, needed to do. Third, 
they have to re-regulate finance so that there are no non-bank banks doing what banks do, creating credit, creating risk, but beyond the purview of the regulators. Um, something like 40% of the credit created uh, in the United States in the last three years was created by institutions that are not subject to any kind of supervision. And uh, with the repeal of Glass-Steagall, with the invention of all kinds of new exotic securities, uh, we really have one big financial services industry. This is what the industry wanted. Well, they got it. And given that fact, it all has to be regulated basically the same way. It all needs capital adequacy standards. It all needs supervision. Uh, there cannot be any such thing as a derivative security that is a privately traded contract. Uh, one of the basic concepts in standard economics is the concept of price discovery. If I put my house on the market and I think it's worth $800,000 and uh, no buyer is willing to pay more than $500,000 and it sells for $500,000, the process of supply and demand has discovered the price. Ditto with the stock market, ditto with the ordinary bond market, even ditto with ordinary options and futures. But when you have an exotic derivative like a credit default swap, uh, something that is going to cost the taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars and maybe more that before this is over, there's no price discovery because it's not publicly traded. There's no transparency. You don't know what it's worth until somebody tries to sell it and then it turns out maybe it's worth nothing. That writ large is the story of this whole financial crisis. And um, to, to give a sense of the bipartisan responsibility for this catastrophe, uh, when Brooksley Bourne, who was then the chair of the Commodity Future Trading Commission uh, in the mid-90s, Clinton appointee, tried to increase the regulation of derivatives, saw this coming, uh, all the old boys ganged up on her, Rubin and Summers and Greenspan, and uh, bludgeoned her into submission. Uh, my friend Jim Stone, who was the first head of CFTC under Jimmy Carter, has been pushing for 30 years uh, the idea that um, there should not be any derivative contracts traded over the counter or not traded over the counter as private contracts. They should all be uh, exchange traded. And so there are lots of things like this. Uh, another one is the bond rating agencies. Uh, the, the credit rating agencies are... Uh, conflicts of interest at their, at their absolute core. They are paid by the people who create the securities to give the securities good ratings. It's exactly analogous to the accounting scandals of the, uh, of the late 90s. Credit rating agencies should either be public agencies paid for by tax dollars or they should be nonprofits where there, there are no such uh, conflicts of interest. So these are radical remedies. On the other hand, the kind of remedies that Roosevelt proposed and he only got about half of them through in the 30s. Um, they were radical remedies, too. If you go back and read the history, um, the creation of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Glass-Steagall Act, uh, deposit insurance, uh, if you listen to the people testifying from Wall Street, this was going to kill American capitalism. And, of course, it saved uh, American capitalism. Lastly, uh, he's going to have to spend a lot more public money than he thinks right now. There's an argument going on right now between the Obama people and the, the congressional leadership um, in the House. Should the stimulus be 250, 250 billion in the first year? Should it be 100 billion? Uh, I argue in the book that we need to increase public spending by about four percentage points of GDP. It just happens that that's $700 billion. Uh, but Wall Street got the first uh, tranche, as they say, of that $700 billion. Uh, Main Street needs to get the next uh, several tranches, meaning that there are all kinds of public systems that have been undercut over the past 30 years. There is a trillion six, $1.6 trillion of deferred maintenance uh, in basic public infrastructure. Just across the river in Hoboken, where you've had a huge building boom, uh, they have a, uh, a water and sewer system from the 19th century that's so primitive that uh, wastewater and um, uh, flood water 
uh, are commingled in the same sewer system. And um, on top of this, you now have a whole row, if you look across the river, high rises that this water and sewer system was not designed for. You multiply that times a thousand uh, all over the country. Uh, bridges, uh, tunnels, schools, public buildings, the electricity grid. Um, you could easily have a serious uh, program in repair of basic public infrastructure. You could complement that with public spending on uh, green energy. Um, uh, John Bradamus and I were talking at breakfast uh, one of the scandals of the last 20 years is that as intergovernmental revenue aid has dried up, state after state after state has uh, balanced its budgets on the backs of America's great public universities. Universities that used to be 80 or 90 percent funded by the state legislature are now 15, 20 percent funded by the state legislature, and tuition has to make up the difference. And so instead of kids from uh, non-affluent families being able to get an affordable education at a great public university, these kids uh, graduate college uh, with debt, and then on top of that, they have trouble getting health insurance. On top of that, they have trouble affording uh, to become homeowners. And so you've got a whole generation of young people who start out their lives with these financial millstones, um, spending that we need to do to prevent a classic a macroeconomic collapse of purchasing power is also spending that we need to do to restore public systems that have been left to ruin and then, I say this as a good liberal, restore the ideology that the role of government is to help ordinary people and to restore the credibility of government in the eyes of voters. So this is Obama's opportunity. Uh, if he doesn't do it, he will very much be in the same situation as Hoover was where the recession is deepening and he's chasing it and doing too little and too late. You have all the classic signs, retail sales collapsing, layoffs increasing, uh, credit markets being frozen, state and local governments laying off people as a depression or recession rather deepens. And of course, all you have to do is write a check for about $100 billion and no state or local government will have to lay off anybody. No state or local government will have to have education cuts or uh, cuts in police and fire and first responders. The only thing holding this back is the tyranny of the conventional wisdom. And the conventional wisdom is that uh, deficits are a bigger worry than a depression. That's the view. You hear it over and over again from the media. Obama gives a speech and says we, we need to put X billions of dollars uh, into infrastructure and the shock reporter says, well, my God, that'll increase the deficit. I mean, I ask you, which is the lesser evil? A bigger deficit for a couple of years or a Great Depression too? And um, let me leave you with some statistics, God help us. Uh, the, the ratio of debt to GDP, even after uh, George Bush's uh, deficit spree, it's only about 40%. Public debt is 40% of one year's GDP. Uh, at the end of World War II, the public debt was 124% of one year's GDP, and that was on the eve of a great boom. Now, how could that be? How could a nation saddled with that kind of a debt have a 25-year boom? And the answer is to look at what we spent the debt on. We spent the debt on the recapitalization of American industry during the war, the retraining of American workers during the war, the reemployment of American workers during the war, uh, science, technology. We came out of the war as the world's uh, industrial leader and uh, the wartime production boom turned into a post-war consumer boom. So the question isn't uh, within reason uh, whether we can afford more debt. The question is what we spend the debt on. If we increase the debt to GDP ratio from 40 to maybe 60 percent and that spares us a, a second Great Depression, uh, it's not exactly rocket science to know uh, which is the lesser evil. So I hope uh, President Obama and his people uh, have read my book. <laughs> I hope, I, 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 I think there are three reasons why he's more likely to succeed and, th than to fail. Uh, and one of them is not my book. Um, one of them is his own character and his own capacity for leadership, and this is a teachable moment. Uh, another uh, is his desire not to fail. But the third thing we have on our side is reality. 
And it's very quickly going to sink in that uh, the choice is to be bold or to fail. And uh, I think this is an impressive enough man that uh, I think he'll be bold. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. That was absolutely excellent and so timely. And I know we'll probably have a lot of questions. So um, will you wait till the microphone comes to you and please identify yourself, um, Edith? Let's try. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Edith Everett. I was hanging on every word. It was outstanding. I thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Uh, two things. One is, uh, to what extent do you blame uh, repeal of Glass-Steagall as one of the uh, reasons for this debacle, number one? The other thing is, I think the most important thing that's on most of our minds is jobs. <clears throat> that seems to be the fundamental thing. How do you feel we can start recreating jobs? Good questions. Um, well, the repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1999 was, was the capstone of a kind of bipartisan crusade to let banks do whatever they wanted to. And um, Glass-Steagall had been de facto repealed, for the most part, by administrative exemptions which were permitted by the Federal Reserve before uh, it was finally given a decent burial. Uh, the, the line back then was, well, it's the 90s. We don't need a 30s system. and uh, what actually happened was banks kept innovating and regulators and the Congress showed no interest in keeping up with the innovations. So Glass-Steagall was one uh, character among, among many. You, you know the Agatha Christie murder on the Orient Express and the solution is they all did it. Um, Glass-Steagall was, was one of the uh, suspects that plunged in one of the knives, the, the repeal. Um, I, I was at a conference at the UN yesterday, and one of my co-panelists um, was Dr. Reddy, who just retired as the um, head of the Central Bank of India. And I said, how are you doing in this crisis? He said, oh, we're doing fine. I said, really? He said, well, we're worried about the collapse of global purchasing power, but we did not permit any of these exotic investments by banks, so we have been spared this crisis. He said, but we, we leave this sort, he was so modest. He said, we leave this sort of thing to the advanced countries. <laughs> <laughs> now, jobs, you know, the, the way to get jobs is to prevent the collapse of purchasing power. And you do this, uh, it's just classic anti-recession medicine. You do this by uh, a lot of uh, short-term stimulus and long-term increase in, in public investment. It, it provides jobs directly, and then when you put a floor under a collapsing economy, then you don't lose jobs uh, indirectly. Thank you. I, too, was fascinated by what you had to say, and thank you very much. Um, you emphasized to be bold and radical steps, and yet your response about jobs was very traditional. I mean, why don't you suggest, or why, doesn't, why don't they look at a works program such as they had in the, uh, during the Depression. If we had that, we wouldn't have to help this, these terrible automobile companies who don't deserve my money to be kept in business for making bad cars, making SUVs at a time when we, everybody was talking about the, the quality of the air and so forth and so on. The people who would lose jobs, it would be catastrophic. But we could create jobs for yes. them. Detroit certainly needs a, a green jobs program. Well, I think I think we're saying we're, we're saying the same thing. I, I was proposing seven hundred billion dollars a year of public spending for things like infrastructure and green redevelopment, green jobs. That makes me the sort of furthest out of any mainstream commentator in what I'm proposing. And much of this goes for jobs. It also goes to invent a lot of technology, uh, repair a lot of infrastructure. So. You know, your scene is not with it if you call it the WPA. I wouldn't call it the WPA. But it's an infrastructure program. Okay, that's great. But I'm not finished, if I may. Proceed. I, I want to know, as a liberal, uh, which I've always thought of myself as, why has not the, the liberal community <clears throat> or the Democrat community cried out about the bad job that Paulson has done? Oh, I, I mean, think we haven't been shy in criticizing. I haven't Paulson. heard very much. I'm sorry. We well, imitated Gordon Brown. As, I mean, 
Paul Krugman made the suggestion that Gordon Brown, what he was doing was wonderful and he hoped that we would do it. We emulated him up to the point of not insisting that they lend money the way Gordon Brown did. And yet I don't hear people. Well, I, certainly we all ought to be speaking with a louder voice. The, the, the good news is this man is only going to be in office for another nine weeks. He's a lame duck. <laughs> Uh, the, but, but Congress has uh, been fairly tough on Paulton. Paulton came in and said, please give me a blank check or the world will come to an end. And the Democrats said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to change the legislation in several ways. They didn't change it enough. They gave him too much discretionary power, but that was the price of getting Bush to sign the thing. We're, we're in this interregnum uh, where the new team is ready to take over, but they don't take over until January 20th. I think uh, Obama has been very shrewd not to get pulled into Paulson's uh, efforts to get him to put his fingerprints on Paulson's version of a rescue. Uh, he's right not to attend the summit, uh, the global summit, which is not going to accomplish anything because it's being presided over by a lame duck administration. Roosevelt had something of the same problem with Hoover. Hoover tried to create a kind of a co-presidency during the five months between uh, November uh, of 32 and March of 33 and Roosevelt even though things were even more dire then, said, I want to start clean. So uh, Congress has given Paulson a rough time. Uh, he, sh he should be given a rougher time. Well, the only part of the press I can control is the American prospect, and I've sure given him a hard time. Uh, I'm Ed Marshner. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Obama's advisors are reading your book, but I'm sure that the columnist who, or the opinion piece in the Financial Times last weekend, a very brief little piece called Obama Has a Chance to Become Another Roosevelt, certainly must have read your book. Uh, so. his, his emphasis was, as I recall, that um, the distinction between the circumstances surrounding the arrival in power of Roosevelt, Carter, Reagan, and Obama. and emphasizing the fact that we are now in a deflationary environment where the cost of an, a radical program is absolutely affordable, whereas when uh, Carter came in, it was a heavily inflationary environment right, exactly. and catastrophic to think about doing that. I wondered if you'd expand well, on I that think that's bit. right. I mean, when you think about the fact that people are willing to lend the Treasury uh, money at around 4% for 30 years, uh, that tells you that inflationary expectations are not exactly a problem. And um, this means that uh, you don't have the kind of constraints that you had when, when Carter took office. And also, the, the crash on Wall Street was also the crash of an ideology. And Obama needs to make that explicit. When, when an old ideology crashes, it doesn't mean that it automatically ushers in a new ideology. The new ideology has to be defined by the president. It's a variation, a modern variation, on what Joseph Stiglitz called managed capitalism, or what Paul Samuelson calls a mixed economy, where you let the entrepreneurial private sector do what it does well, and you have the government do what the private market doesn't do well. Not a new idea, but new circumstances. And uh, he's got a, a working majority in Congress, only the third time since Roosevelt, and uh, only one president who had a working majority in Congress since Roosevelt, uh, Lyndon Johnson in the 89th Congress, really used it well. Carter had a lot of Democrats in Congress, but Carter took office as an outsider and remained an outsider, never built the necessary bridges to Congress. He squandered his majority. Uh, Clinton took office with about the same size, size majority that uh, Obama now has. Uh, blew it on uh, an ill-conceived health reform that he did not work with Congress to uh, design, uh, spent a lot of political capital on NAFTA, and it just got away from him. Uh, in some respects, Obama's working majority is even bigger because you don't have any more Dixiecrats. Uh, you, you, you only have uh, moderate to liberal Democrats. You don't have any right-wing Democrats anymore. And the other reason I think that he's well positioned to succeed is that the country wants him to succeed. The country can't afford to have him fail. And I'm just imagining the scene, let's say it's February 1st, the unemployment rate is 11%, and Obama has sent up an emergency spending package of $400 billion. Now, you're a Republican congressman, and your phone is ringing off the hook from mayors 
and county executives and small businesses saying, for God's sake, help us. Are you going to vote against that? I don't think so. And I also think there are five or six senators. You know, you hear a lot about the Democrats just barely fell short of the magic number 60. You look at Susan Collins and Olympia Snow, the two moderate Republican senators from Maine, or Arlen Specter, uh, or even John McCain, for that matter, who just hated the whipping that they took from the Bush White House. I don't think you're going to see very many filibusters uh, against Obama either. Bob James, I'm a businessman, as you may know when I give you my questions. Um, I hear what you say about the market problems, and there's no question about the market problems. But what I hear from you is that you have a lot of faith in the government, and I don't hear much other than faith about that. Uh, one last comment on that. Uh, if it's Roosevelt you're looking at, Remember, I'm sure you know, I lived through it. Uh, by 1937, he still had 20% unemployment. By 1942, he got down to 8, and you know what happened to get to 8% unemployment there. I doubt if it was the, his stuff. One last thing. Did you say that there was an oil bailout? No. I thought you said that. No. Oh, I just misunderstood it. Yeah. Well, um, one of my favorite moments on the right-wing talk show circuit where I have been appearing to promote my books was uh, when a, a guy said to me, you think the government is smarter than the smartest guys on Wall Street? And I said, well, the smartest guys on Wall Street just lost $2 trillion, $3 trillion. Uh, There's $500 trillion of derivatives out there. Nobody knows what they're worth. Nobody knows what they are. Yeah, uh, I have a lot of faith in the government. I mean... If only the balance sheets of the money center banks were in as good a shape as the balance sheet of Social Security, the country would be better off. This is not a conventional view. But uh, even Mr. Paulson, who's not exactly a Bolshevik, uh, when it all collapses, who does he turn to? It doesn't turn to Citigroup, it turns to the U.S. Treasury. And uh, Sheila Baer is a heck of a lot more competent than nine out of ten of the geniuses on Wall Street who brought us this tragedy. So, yeah. I have a lot of faith in the government. And I suspect that even more people are going to have a lot of faith in the government. I think one of the problems is that the Bush administration uh, argued that the government couldn't do anything right and then kept on proving the point. Uh, and you need people who believe in government to run government. Otherwise, they run it uh, into the ground. Now, as far as the 30s is concerned, uh, you're right. Uh, not right on the statistics. Let me be precise on the statistics. Um, Unemployment bottomed out at uh, 25% in 1933. By 1939, it was still 12.8%. That's a, a depression. And it's very fashionable to say that uh, the New Deal didn't cure the depression, the war cured the depression. Uh, unemployment during the war was 2%. There were shortages, there were manpower shortages. That's why women and blacks got opportunities during the war that they didn't get any other time in American history because we needed the manpower and the woman power. What does that tell you? It tells you that Roosevelt didn't spend enough money because during the war we had deficits of 30% of GDP. And I don't think things are going to get that bad, but uh, think about it. Even though much of the production that was created during the war was built only to be blown up, we still had record economic growth during the war and within about a year, once we mobilized for war, unemployment melted away. Well, I don't know what that tells you. What it tells me is it's better to spend a little bit too much than to spend too little if you're on the verge of a depression. Sandra Stein, I want to ask you about uh, bailing out country, uh, companies and helping them. It seems to me that the basic thing is if you give money, not only to know what it's used for, but whether it can accomplish uh, what, it's, uh, what you're trying to do. So taking AIG as the first example, here they didn't have an end plan. I mean, from what I understand, they have $400 billion of CDSs that they're still liable for. 
So once we start to put money, are we going to stop at 150 billion? I mean, without visibility and knowing the end game, I don't think we should get involved. If we have trillions of dollars of these financial uh, dark matter floating around, it, I think before we guarantee something, we should know what we're guaranteeing, what are the limits, and what's the effect. So going back to General Motors, um, it would seem like if we're going to give money, we should know is it going to solve the problem, and if right. not, we should structure it to know the full picture. I, I couldn't agree more, and I think, um, you know, there were three and a half years between uh, the, the crash of 1929 and the Roosevelt administration. Mercifully, there's only three and a half months between the crash of 2008 and the Bush administration leaving office and the, and the new team coming in. I think Paulson is making a, a complete mess of this. Um, the, the, their strategy is to hire other investment banks uh, to clean up the messes created by different investment banks. Um, you got a 35-year-old uh, wunderkind uh, with the wonderful Dickensian name of Cash Carry um, <laughs> throwing money at Wall Street uh, without very many conditions. And AIG is the classic case. On the other hand, um, AIG is on the hook for so much uh, insurance, credit default swaps, and it's an example of the house of cards that was created by the complete laxity uh, uh, on the part of the regulators. So can you afford to just let it go down the drain? You know, that's what they did with Lehman Brothers. Hey, let's let this one go down the drain. It's not named Goldman, and uh, we'll just let it go. Uh, well, that's taken a pretty big gamble. But, but I think you're absolutely right that if you're going to do these rescues, you have to be much more hands-on. You have to know what the end game is. You have to know what the risks are going in to the extent that you can. And, and you raise another point. Um, there's a story in this morning, I guess it was in the Times, that everybody's lined up to get their own bailout, right? You have the people who manufacture boats because people are not buying very many luxury boats right now. They're lined up to get a rescue. Detroit's lined up. Um, you, you, you cannot bail out every country in America. That, that's why I'm a Keynesian. It's much better to put a floor under purchasing power and resume a normal supply and demand situation, and then the household sector, which is 70% of the economy, they buy things, and retail sales rebound, and people get hired again than it is to bail out industry at the level of bailing out individual companies. At the same time, particularly in the financial sector, there are cases where you do need to go in and clean up balance sheets because the financial sector is just too important to allow uh, to, to fail. That's why Roosevelt had a reconstruction finance corporation, so that in addition to the public work spending and the regulation and all the other stuff that he did, there were cases where government needed to infuse capital. But when the RFC infused capital, it put people on the board. It got a look at the books. It didn't just uh, throw money away. So this is, this is really hard stuff, but the stakes are huge. Peter Russell. Uh, it, one of the legacies of the last eight years may be that income disparities have greatly widened. And in this economic dislocation, right. probably get worse. What will Obama administration be able to do to rectify that? Well, um, one of the things I've proposed uh, in my book is uh, the idea that you take some of this additional spending that I'm calling for and you use it to uh, upgrade, professionalize uh, every single job in the human services. Uh, you have people taking care of our children, taking care of our aging parents who are untrained with two or three hundred percent annual rates of turnover making seven bucks an hour. Uh, in Europe, these are professional jobs. They're not astronomically paid, but they're middle-class jobs. And for about $100 billion a year, you could provide that anybody working in a daycare center or pre-kindergarten or uh, uh, a nursing home uh, is at least a paraprofessional with the opportunity to become a professional. And uh, these are the jobs that can't be exported. Uh, it would also be good for our kids. 
and good for the dignity of our parents. Uh, I think the Employee Free Choice Act, which, which uh, uh, restores the rights that are supposedly guaranteed under the Wagner Act so that unions stand a, a fair shot at organizing, uh, would also help uh, raise wages. And I think all of this public works and infrastructure and green development spending that I'm calling for, all of that creates middle class jobs. Uh, construction jobs are good jobs. Uh, retrofitting homes for energy efficiency, good jobs. High speed rail, good jobs. So um, there are lots of beneficial side effects to outlays that he needs to have uh, done for macroeconomic reasons in any case, and then we can get all this other uh, benefit out of it. You're absolutely correct, Harry Langer, you're absolutely correct that, that jobs are the underlying solution to all the problems. But by, you cannot just have infrastructure and green jobs by itself. No. And also, and, and uh, uh, with the government providing the funds for it. They, can, they have no funds. All they're doing is printing money, which will cause stagflation. If you want to create wealth, you have to have the kind of, we have to cater to the industries where we can be successful, which is high, all the aspects of high technology and, and get involved in the global economy and bring jobs back to this country. Export <coughs> goods and not jobs. And you can do that with high tech export free zone program, national program, for the major urban, urban centers, which could do that kind of job. Could you comment on that? Sure. Um, I guess I dispute the idea that government can create wealth. Uh, when government makes it affordable for kids to go to college, government creates wealth. Uh, when uh, National Science Foundation or National Institutes of Health uh, put money into research and development that in turn allows America's pharma pharmaceutical companies to be the world's leaders, that creates wealth. And I think in normal times, you leave most of this to the private sector, but in uh, dire economic times, the government has to step into the vacuum. I completely agree with you that we need to rely on technology uh, and to start exporting again to start manufacturing uh, in America again. Uh, I'm not sure uh, tax-free export zones in the absence of a whole bunch of other policies are going to be any kind of a silver bullet. But, you know, for 30 years, industrial policy has been a dirty word. Every other country practices it. But the idea that it should matter to us whether we have an auto industry or a semiconductor industry or high-speed rail industry, that's very controversial. That's picking winners. Government's not supposed to pick winners. Well, what is Hank Paulson doing if he's not picking winners and losers? So we're, we're a little bit pregnant here, and we might as well do it right. Last question. Um, we'll wait for the second question. Yeah. Um, that was a splendid talk. Tonight. Thanks, John. Uh, I think that not enough attention has been paid to the advantage of having uh, two members of the United States Senate become president and vice president and a leader of the House of Representatives become chief of the White House staff. In my last four years in the House as the whip, I would every other week join the other Democratic leaders of the House and Senate for breakfast with the president and vice president. We have a Democratic president and vice president. We have Democrats in larger majorities in the House and Senate. What suggestions do you have for encouraging close cooperation between the two? Because otherwise, we won't yeah. be able to attack these problems. Well, that's a good question. Uh, Obama has been underrated at every uh, stage of his career. And uh, one of the very astute things he did during the campaign was to put a lot of uh, veterans uh, of Congress in senior positions in the campaign, Tom Daschle, uh, Dashiell's former chief of staff, Pete Rouse, Jim, Jim Messina, who used to be uh, um, Max Baucus's chief uh, of staff. He uh, not only appointed uh, Rahm Emanuel, former uh, congressman, as his own chief of staff, but as his, this just blew me away, it made my day, as his director of congressional relations, which is one of the single most important uh, positions, he appointed a guy named Phil Shalero, who was Henry Waxman's longtime chief of staff. Henry Waxman's probably the most effective progressive legislator in the House. So he's being very, very astute in creating the groundwork for, for good relations with Congress. Um, his people have been having uh, meetings several times a week with, uh, with Speaker Pelosi. Uh, you know, for somebody who's supposed to be not very experienced, 
Uh, he really seems to have a sure hand. He really seems to know what he's doing. So um, I am uh, audaciously hopeful, and uh, I thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Fabulous. Thank you very, very much. Um, and I just want to remind you that um, both books are available for you to purchase. I'm sure they'll go fast. <laughs>